Okay, so hello, my name is Tom Davis. I'm from the University of Glasgow, and my uh, PhD research uh, was in uh, basically a review of the use of sacrifice, generally speaking, in the Viking burials of Britain and Ireland, or the Insta region, if you prefer, uh, including the Isle of Man. And um, today I'm going to, well, I, I've kind of put up this uh, very tag esque title. I thought I'd be challenging, I thought I'd sort of go a little bit slightly off the beaten track. I wasn't going to try and condense the PhD down into 15 minutes, uh, but I thought I'd uh, review some tensions and some uh, thoughts and, uh, and some questions I kind of have which have came into my mind while I was doing my research. So hopefully that's, that's going to fly with you today. So I'm going to talk about something I'm... Uh, calling the dramatic turn in the interpretation of Viking burial ritual. Um, and then I want to move on to point two, which is like asking questions like, are some Viking burials not actually static things at all, but were they revisited, reused, reworked? Were they, in fact, in some sense, mausoleums? Or is it mausolea? Is anyone more obvious to say mausolea? Um, and then I'll just quickly overview some uh, particularly regional uh, patterning of animal sacrifice in the Viking burials of the British Isles, and come up with some thoughts at the end, some conclusions, hopefully. So many recent studies have emphasized the dramatic and performative nature of Viking burials, and early medieval furnished burials uh, in, uh, in, in total, um, particularly the work of Neil Price um, and, and Martin Carver, uh, when he's uh, discussing the, Ang uh, the Anglo-Saxon ship burial at Sutton Hoo. And they've specifically connected the uh, emotional and dramatic and performative nature of, like, of, of burial rituals with some kind of performance which is then imprinted onto the, uh, into the minds, into the memories, into the stories and oral histories of the people watching. And this kind of gets transmitted through the ages as a kind of poetry, as the beginnings of poetry. So, for example, Neil Price has written, Viking Age burials may have involved complex elements of mortuary theatre, ritual narratives literally enacted at the graveside, providing a poetic passage for the individual dead into a world of ancestral stories. Um, this is a connected to other ideas which are current, such as the idea of burials, burials being tableaus or... or uh, basically the idea that, that the, the dead were lying in state and then people were coming along, paying their respects, paying their, uh, and being kind of impressed by the visual, the, the, the visual um, and kind of uh, picture-like kind of aspects of the, of the dead. And I think this has in, ter in turn um, influenced the way we interpret Viking funerals, particularly um, in the... Uh, field of visual interpretation and of we have these really wonderful uh, kind of portrayals so these are in my view beautiful engaging but also kind of staged looking kind of having a sort of uh, even nice lighting going on um, and more than that really it kind of gives across the impression that these are reified these are static these are necessarily placed in, in one go at all times. It reflects an idea that Viking burials are, in fact, to some degree, um, um, not reworked. And we've seen this picture before, and it, this is great that we've come onto this. Uh, I've been able to talk after the papers before that. Uh, we've looked at, heard about Eben Fudland's um, account of the Rus, um, a ship, a ship cremation on the Volga. Um, and of course, this is probably the single most famous account of any Viking Age uh, ritual, but it, as we've already heard from, from Claudia, uh, it lasted for several days. There was uh, all kinds of um, um, things like processes um, depicted on this uh, image by Henrik Szymorowski, including animal sacrifice, human sacrifice, um, the, the destruction of, uh, uh, the placing of weapons and the whole thing going up in a, um, in a cremation. However, I think that this kind of uh, image that we see from Szymorowski here is reflective of the old romantic um, 
artistic image of uh, the Viking as the noble savage. This kind of trope, I think, still is reflected in some of these uh, more modern interpretations um, uh, that we still have of the Vikings. So if you look at some aspects of Viking Age mortuary uh, um, archaeology, we have a, a quite a considerable amount of literature now which is uh, focused on the idea of reuse and also disturbance. So the idea that in one sense for Vikings quite often, as, as a lot of early medieval peoples were doing, were, were, when they went to new places they were appropriating already numinous sites, already sacred sites. So for example at Ballin Abbey on Isla we have this um, uh, Viking Age cemetery placed quite clearly referencing this Stone Age um, uh, a very prominent um, standing stone and research such as by Alison Klevnas has uh, and Bill, uh, Jan Bill and Aoife Daly has uh, like examined the quite common uh, fact that a lot of elite ship burials and other burials were being dug into at later stages for various purposes including maybe translation of bones into uh, Christian cemeteries at the time of Christianization or perhaps, as Bill and Daly uh, argue, this could be a politics thing. So you've got something like the Usaburra ship burial, the most famous ship burial in the ship museum of Oslo. It was dug into um, about 70, 80 years later, and this has been interpreted as a political change. So therefore, this, this mound still had political uh, and numinous, if you like, uh, power agency within, its, uh, within later, later generations. But what you're getting here is the idea that, again, these are active, these are um, being created and recreated all the time, and of course Howard Williams here at the University of Chester has written extensively on this subject also. So there might be an, an idea that, and at least in some cases, some Viking burials were indeed mausoleums. So for example, um, an excavation at Little Nupar um, was proposed very tentatively by the excavators as a, a potential case of a central boat grave being used as a mausoleum and so this was uh, associated with a farm settlement there was a minimum of six horse and dog burials uh, around it there were several burials referencing a central boat burial which seems to be potentially the first settler um, uh, the boats uh, the boat burial contained a minimum of three human in inhumations two males and one female very few human bones were found in the burials outside the boat burial at all, in the other cuts you see there. Um, and all the burials were mixed and disturbed, mixed and disturbed, including this horse burial here, which had been uh, reopened and all the horse bones had been stacked up very neatly at the side. So somebody had clearly gone in and interacted with it, possibly taking the human bones out, but then the horse burials were, uh, the horse, bo horse bones were stacked up. And this was tentatively suggested that the, that the as I was saying, the, the main uh, boat burial in the centre was indeed some kind of family mausoleum rather than a single event, rather than this dramatic single event. It was actually being reworked over a considerable period of time. Okay, so the next part of my talk comes with a slight health warning in that I'm going to speculate wildly about some very well-known Viking Age burials from the British Isles. Uh, most of these do contain animal... Uh, well, two of them contain animal uh, sacrifices as well. So firstly, Balladool on the Isle of Man. Now, this boat burial, as you can see here, prominently located on a, on a, on a hill. There's lots of interesting things to draw out about this in terms of its landscape location. Um, <coughs> um, I could speculate all day about that. But just to get to the point, there's something to, to note about it is that it was a warrior, although this is a high-status warrior burial, um, it only has one item of weaponry in it, a shield. Um, another thing to note is that there was extensive mixing of the bones, apparently some either to do with rabbits or to do with the, the slighting of the grave, as, as was uh, previously, uh, uh, as was one interpretation of it, 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 in putting the grave, sorry, it, in putting in the boat grave, it had slighted supposedly some earlier burials, which could account for some of this mixing of the bone. Another aspect is that everything seems to be, at least one half of the boat seems to be completely empty, um, and the other half of the boat, um, as you can see here, um, has very little in it. And Dirk's giving me looks. Oh. 
Um, another potential is the famous uh, boat burial from Cloran Bay in Colonsay, um, which contained this horse. Um, um, and a range of wonderful artifacts include these famous uh, balance, bail, uh, balance beam scale and weights. Um, but recent reassessment by James Graham Campbell has suggested that this, in fact, has more than one bur uh, burial in it, potentially two. Um, this has always been assumed to be one single warrior trader. But are we again looking at something similar with several burials going in? Of course, this, is, this was dug in the 1880s. It's very, uh, we just don't have the archaeological kind of like baseline to see if we can suss this out in any archaeological sense. So it is a kind of a speculation. Um, but perhaps the idea of it being a mausoleum or something along those lines could be a suggested context for these well-discussed Christian grave slabs which were incorporated into the burial structure. Now this has been thought of, these are earlier, they're brought, brought in as some kind of appropriation, or it could be some kind of syncretism. The person was being buried as a full pagan Viking with a horse burial and the rest of it, but then they were putting Christian grave slabs in the end of their grave just to be on the safe side. Or it could be that somebody's coming on maybe at a slightly later date and either re, um, re-consecrating the grave or reusing it, or possibly even someone else was buried nearby. Of course, as I say, speculation. But to come on to another example, which is more recent, um, and again, this is a th another potential way of looking at the scar boat burial, is that instead of being one single, well, let me just explain, this was a boat burial with three uh, occupants, an old lady, um, a juvenile, and a, um, um, an adult male, and again, it's always been assumed that they're all put in at the same time. And you can see the amount of disturbance it had. It was half eaten away by the waves um, yeah, and coastal erosion. Um, however, there are discrepancies in the radiocarbon dates. The old woman seems to have a lot be older than the, than the juvenile, for example. But this could be explained through various reasons. Another potential oddity about the grave is the positioning of the male grave uh, the male's leg the male burial had its leg at a, a pretty much a weird angle 90 degrees coming away from it now this has always been said well they probably died somewhere else and they were in rigor mortis in this weird way and they were then put in the grave another potential idea i think is that the grave chamber was reopened and somebody pushed the pushed the burial out and pushed its leg into that position while it was still had flesh on the bones. Now, again, a speculation. So these are some ideas that I've been having. Um, so just to go over some other aspects, just very quickly, well, just at the end. So my research just generally uh, looked at the use of animal or animal weapon and human sacrifice. So this map shows basically the patterning of the animal sacrifice and um, one just very quickly want to point out that we have pretty much very little evidence from most of the areas associated with um, uh, Viking settlement. They're really contained within very specific locations. So just to show you here, the island of Westray has a, a, a lot. The island of Colonsay has a lot. Isle of Man has a lot. Nothing in Shetland, nothing for the rest of Orkney, nothing for the Western Isles, nothing for Galloway. Nothing for Cumbria apart from some graves with horse fittings. Um, so nothing really from Ireland. There are some very difficult to interpret examples from Ireland, but I left them off this slide. Um, the only other clear examples we have is Heath Wood, which is here, which is clearly associated with the Viking Great Army, and Reading down here, which is again clearly associated with the Viking Great Army. And that dot there is wrong, so we'll just ignore that one. Um, <laughs> <coughs> so, just these are some various sort of tangential kind of ways of looking at um, the use of animal sacrifice, in particular in, in Viking Age graves. Firstly, graves are complex, they're dynamic, they're active, and our interpretation should reflect this. And I know it's always great to have a wonderful, beautiful picture, but it may not always be entirely accurate. It may be more for our um, entertainment than our edutainment, if you like. Um, 
sacrifice is not that widespread. It seems to be confined to small islands. I think there's sort of, you know, these are potentially strategically located martial polities. It seems to be confined to the ninth century. Our dating evidence is difficult to interpret, but I would, wouldn't be surprised at all if they were all pretty much late ninth century and really uh, to do with this upsurge of the militarized Viking violence, the great armies. And also it's a kind of a conservative practice, this past in the past, this uh, always referencing this heroic past. And that might be a reason why it seems to just vanish quite quickly. So even in the later 10th century and onwards, we've got very little evidence of the continuing use of animal sacrifice, in my opinion. Although furnished burial in and of itself doesn't die away that quickly, but the actual sacrificial or animal sacrifice part of it seems to not be carried on too far into the 10th century. Okay, thank you.